Okay, your meeting is now live. Good morning, and um, well, welcome to the Primary Care Commission Committee meeting. I'm Margaret Gary, the lay member, I'll be chairing the meeting today. We are meeting virtually in response to the limitations placed on governance by the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the public have been invited to view this meeting via a link available from the NHS Portsmouth Clinical Commissioning Group website, and papers for the meeting are also available via this website. Today's meeting is being recorded so that in the event of a failure of technology, it can continue and will then be updated onto the NHS Portsmouth Clinical Commissioning Group website as soon as possible. Committee members and attendees are requested to keep their microphones on mute and will need to turn them on when they are called to speak. Please use a raised hand to indicate that you wish to speak. Please can I ask everyone taking part today to confirm that they are present when I call your name and then you can turn on your microphones and give your name and title. So can we start with um, Mark Compton? Morning all, Mark Compton, Director of Transformation, Portland CCG. Sam Cooper. Simon Cooper, Director of Primary Care and Medicines Optimization at Portal CCG. Julia O'Mara. Yeah. Dr. Nick Moore. I'm Nick Moore, I'm a GP on Portal CCG. Jackie Powell. Morning, Jackie Powell, lay member for Portal CCG. David Scarborough. Good morning, uh, David Scarborough, I'm the CCG's Practice Manager Representative. Um, um, Michelle Spanley. Hi, I'm Michelle Spanley, I'm Chief Finance Officer for the CCG. Jo York. Hi, Jo York, uh, Deputy, Chief Health, Deputy Chief Officer, Health and Care Portsmouth. Roger Batterbury. Hello, I'm Roger Batterbury, I'm the Chairperson at Health Watch Portsmouth. Sylvia Macy. Good morning, Sylvia Macy, Primary Care and Estates Programme Manager for the CCG. Christine Horan. Hi, Chris Horan, Primary Care Improvement Manager. Justina Jeffs. Good morning, Justina Jeffs, Head of Governance. Steve McInnes. Good morning, Steve McInnes, Head of Primary Care, Portsmouth CCG. Stephen Arobia. Hi, Stephen Arobio, Clinical Quality Manager for Portsmouth CCG. And Lisa Stray. Lisa Stray, Executive Assistant for Business Services. We, we have a number of apologies which Lisa will uh, note and will be in the minutes. So can we then start? So have I left anyone out? Yeah. Hi there, if I can just come in, it's Claire Curry here, Consultant in Public Health, Portsmouth City Council here for Helen Atkinson, Director of Public Health. Ah, thank you Claire. Okay. Um, anyone else? Robert Brownsmith is here, I know. Yep. Okay. No Robert, Robert Brownsmith, Medicine yeah. Optimization Pharmacist, Portsmouth CCG. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I then ask if there uh, are any conflicts of interest today that need to be declared. Dave Scarborough and Dr. Nick Moore. Oh, that's the usual, um, you know, obviously as a practicing GP in the city, that's obviously usually noted on most of the agenda items. Yeah, and there are no, none of these are, are direct for you at the moment? No, no specific ones related to my own practice at the moment or any of my other interests, no. Okay, thank you. So, your... so same for me, Margaret. Um, yeah. As a business manager for a GP practice in the city, then... Um, an indirect um, conflict of interest for all of the agenda items. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if, sorry, if, if, if it's an indirect, uh, you are allowed to contribute as usual. Okay, thank you. Um, then can we then move to the minutes of the meeting uh, and look at them for accuracy and we'll deal with actions arising afterwards. Um, page one, page Two, page three, page four, 
page 5, page 6, and page 7. Right. And then there are only two actions, I think, that we agreed, we agreed last time. One was in relation to the chair's action and the standard operating procedures. And I think Justina and Simon were meeting to try and get these on, into a different footing because they happen so often. Yeah. Any, any movement on that? Any progress? Justina? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Simon and I did discuss this and we felt that the original discussions that we had had at the committee covered those changes to the standard operating procedures. Where there is something significant, we'll obviously bring it back to the committee. Um, but as these uh, these are changing regularly, um, then we just felt the original principle was still uh, valid. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the sequel is the, is the other action, and that's back on our agenda today for ratification. So we'll yeah. do that later. And we then move to the risk register. Are there any comments on that? Steve, did you want to say anything about the risk register? No, no I think that is on the agenda shortly. So nothing from me at this stage, thanks. I think it's on the agenda after the minutes, isn't it? So can we deal with that now? Um, I'm not, I might be wrong, but I'm not sure that's a paper that I'm presenting today. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know who's presenting. Excuse me, Chair, I believe Sylvia Pleasy is, yeah. is presenting. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Maybe that she's got technical difficulties and her, her internet is going, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm here. I can, I'm ready to present. <laughs> so the, the, the primary care risk register has been updated to include the identified risks and their mitigations. Uh, there are two high risks which have been identified, which is the practice viability, which is mitigated by active engagement with the practices, monitoring, monitoring of the primary care quality service delivery, CQC and the primary care networks. Uh, and, and the second one, COVID-19 practices ability to deliver services, which is mitigated by uh, SIPREP monitoring, agreed relaxation of some of the contractual requirements, which has happened nationally, uh, and the protection of funding, and the close working with primary care networks with their business continuity plans uh, and Solent to NHS Trust. Um, there are a, a number following the of items following the review uh, of risks which we have significantly reduced or don't feel are any longer active um, and so there are three that we would like to request the closure of um, so primary care uh, sorry PMS practice premium which has been mitigated by the investment plans of the premium payments uh, and the reduced funding is now complete within this uh, financial year uh, premises flexibility risk, which is mitigated by the premises improvement grants, the local estate forum overview, and the local estate strategy, which is into the new models of care engagement, which is mitigated by effective engagement mechanisms with the primary care network clinical directors and the clinical directors embedded within the Portsmouth provider partnership. <coughs> I can see a number of questions. <laughs> okay. Now, I saw Nick first, so then Jackie. Yeah, it was just a very quick one. I, I noticed, obviously, just re referring to primary care, and obviously you, you mentioned that, um, obviously, that there's regular dialogue. My, my question was really, is are there any new risks with related to specific practices? And, and obviously, with the sort of programme of visits that we are having, which has now sort of been suspended, and I don't think we completely got through them all last year, and then obviously this year we've had to suspend. Are we confident that um, we are... That, you know, that we're on top of that and, and, and monitoring that appropriately. It sounds like we've got lots of dialogue in place, but just really want to pose that question. Sylvia appears to have frozen on the screen, so I'm not sure if you heard that. Okay. I can come in early. Yeah, if you're able to answer that, Steve, you're probably as well able to answer that, I guess. 
Yes, you're right, Nick. We didn't quite get through all the programme of visits. Um, I think we only had a couple of practices left. So we've been kind of doing some remote monitoring with practices and regular telephone calls. Um, practices on an individual basis um, when it comes to those individual practice risks. You broke up a little bit there, Steve. Do you want to just repeat the last set, couple of sentences? Because I didn't hear that. I think none of us heard that. Oh, sorry. Um, let's turn the camera off. Yeah, so just to say, Nick, um, we are working um, sort of remotely monitoring practices and working with them on an individual basis around any risks. So, for example, recently we had a practice... So we continue to do that on an individual basis. You're breaking up, Steve, at the same place almost exactly. <laughs> so I think it sounds like there's procedures in place. I think rather than try to labour it, I think we can accept. I think I think it does sound like that that Steve is on top of that. So I'm happy with that. We can discuss our, afterwards if we need to. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jackie, you have a question. Hello. I wondered if there needed to be a risk that kind of um, described potentially the big organisational change that could be happening with the white paper and whether anywhere in here we've kind of articulated that as a, as a potential risk in terms of how we fit into the, the system, if you like, and how we keep Portsmouth place-based. Does it need to be described or, or addressed here? It's a question. Um, can I can I answer that one? I think probably it, 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 if it is a risk, it'd be difficult one to describe as a risk as, uh, as the NHS um, priority at the moment is to, to bring that legislation forward. There may be risks attached to it in terms of the change management, but I think at the moment it's not clear that they'd be unique to primary care. Um, and so I think probably there isn't a need to have it on the risk register for primary care at this stage. If there is, if it does become an issue for PCNs, for example, then we can then we can think about that. Okay. Does that yeah, answer? Just the horizon scanning and knowing that something is coming across the horizon for us to be as prepared as we can be actually for for something that feels like it is going to be coming through. I just wouldn't want to miss the boat. If you see what I mean. Thank you, Dave. I just just wanted to wanted to add to that, Margaret, from a, from a practice perspective, and and certainly, you know, in terms of the business going on and primary care practices continuing to deliver the services that they deliver, that I, I don't see the change will 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 place a risk on 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 that on that initially going forward. Um, I think the 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 only risk uh, is in is is the level of support and where the support sits. Um, but until things come out more, then um, I think it's very difficult to, I agree, it's very difficult to articulate that. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments on the risk register? So are people happy to remove the three risks that Sylvia has highlighted? Take silence as a yes. Is there anybody who wants to dissent from that? No? Okay. Okay. Can we then move and having adopted having adopted Sylvia's proposals, can we move to the finance summary with Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. You've got me today, not not Becky. Um she's she's on leave today. Uh, so she's done the usual uh, financial update for primary care specific items. Um she would articulate it much better than I'm going to. So I was just going to highlight that um, we remain um, having a slight benefit against um, the overall budget this financial year um, and are expecting that to continue into month 12. Um, we've highlighted where we are making the claims for relevant allocations that are due to us. Uh, and, uh, also mentioned the additional um, local commissioning scheme to make sure that we've included that in our forecasts uh, and also uh, a note about the COVID-19 claims that we're making on behalf of uh, primary care. 
So I wasn't going to say anything more, just ask if there are any questions um, or concerns that people wanted to raise. Are there any questions, Nick? The yeah, apologies, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but are we not saying that there's a significant deficit on the end of these red mm. figures on the final columns? No, so. I think um, usually we have a little note that says which way round that that would that would work, but in this in this case, it is a benefit. It is okay. I beg your pardon. Sorry, I, I I often get that wrong. Apologies. Yeah, I believe it is. I will just double check that, Nick, because because of all the COVID claims and stuff like that, it might be one of those things that not COVID. Um, hospital discharge scheme and things like that, but I'm pretty certain that primary care remains in a surplus position for the CCG. So I will just double check that for you. And the final col column is the variance against the budget, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie? I could check that immediately. Let me do that. can't read it on my... Jackie? Sorry, it was just it's similar to Nick's question that there is a big underspend around yeah. the uh, PCN what is it, additional roles reimbursement scheme, which I know I haven't quite got my head around why that's such a big underspend. And there was some explanation. I didn't yeah. quite get it. And the same with um, collaborative fees and maternity and such like services. And I wondered if there was a the reason why it's such a big underspend in those areas? Um, well, I can probably answer your first question straight. So, so, Nick, I have looked at the um, numbers, and it is that it, it is a surplus position. We haven't spent as much as we had allocated, so I can confirm that. Uh, in terms of the additional roles, Jackie, the explanation around that is we were allocated a certain sum of money but the PCNs haven't been able to recruit for various reasons, including the fact that we've been in, in a pandemic situation. So we are trying to make sure that we're utilising uh, as much of uh, that as we possibly can, but that's the current position as we stand. Do you think those roles will be needed sort of relatively soon? As we, I know everyone's under, especially primary care, just adapting and the way they've adapted to the virus has been brilliant. Mm -hmm. Is there still a need for these roles or starting to really look at the opportunity to, to have these roles in place? Uh, I or is it once it's gone, it's gone? Operational guys to answer the question, yeah. not and it's not a financial question, I don't think. Okay. Okay. Anyone who can, maybe Joe yeah. then. Joe? Yeah, um, I think... I think the, the the quick answer, the easy answer is is yes. I think primary care will still need these additional roles. Whether that what that looks like moving forward will probably not be in the way um, that that were first envisaged. I would imagine, um, and we need to test that and work through with that. Having said that, there are a number of of additional roles that will will come through over the next year or into the. The following year, um, so the teams will continue to work with PCNs to look at look at that, particularly around mental health, um, and and some of those other roles because we do recognise that there will be changes. Mark and Simon might have more more detail on that as well. Simon, Simon, and Mark, Simon, you want to? Um, yeah, I mean it's it. As, as Joe says, I think there's an easy answer that says yes. There's a much more detailed and longer um, answer that will evolve over the next six months in terms of, of where we see the skill mix, where we want to put those, where there is, um, where the PCN see the need. Um, I, I think one thing, it might seem a little bit to me, the one thing that, that we are certain of is that the delivery of healthcare and primary care is evolving probably quicker now than it has done before. So to have the ability to actually um, implement some of these newer roles and having that, that freedom at PCN level to a degree um, is positive and seen as part of the plans going forward. Whether I could sit here now and describe exactly what they were going to be and how we would spend that money would be just you know, a finger in the wind job. Okay. I guess for me, the part of the question was around when we do want these posts, will the funding be there? Does it kind of sit somewhere waiting for us to use it? Yeah. Yeah. Mark, do you have a comment on that? 
Um, just briefly, just to say that um, obviously we can utilise that funding for those roles. Um, I think it's just recognising the complexity um, involved in, in this because what PCNs can do is uh, go off and, and try to employ some of these individuals, these allied health professionals and the like, um, in isolation. Um, but that probably um, wouldn't be very beneficial in terms of the impact on other community services. It's where a lot of these roles have traditionally sat. So it was just to provide some reassurance to say that we are having conversations with PCN leads. We are having those conversations in conjunction with Solent as well. Um, and we are trying to coordinate as best we can um, how we um, employ those roles, what the model of care would look like. Um, we've you know, done some really great work with uh, physios um, in the last year where we've utilised um, and integrated it with the Solent uh, service um, and we're looking to do that as well with, with the likes of uh, mental health, OT, um, etc. And we're having those joint conversations which I think are really um, beneficial um, and, you know, testament to the kind of uh, good joint working that we have in Portsmouth. Thank you, all of you. That's really helpful. I just didn't want us to lose funding, you know, at this point in time. Thank you, Jackie. Dave, your question or comment? It's a comment, Margaret, and I just wanted to add uh, with regards to the, the, these roles from a PCM perspective, I think the first thing to say is that the funding being made available for these roles is very welcome in primary care. Um, but it, but, it, but it isn't a quick fix and Mark's alluded to the complexities you know around you know employing some of these new roles and it takes time to bed in but I think you know a really important um, factor in in this scheme is that there is no allocation to bring in extra management to to work these things through within the PCN itself and to put the the infrastructure in place to embed the new roles but I would say the roles that we have employed have, have been very good and have brought a lot of benefits to, to practice. So certainly from a PCM perspective, I would hope the funding will remain, but it will take a period to enable to work through all of these things and, and, and you know, uh, bear the fruits, I think, from, from, from those additional roles in primary care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really helpful. Um, Simon, your hand's still up. Yeah, just just um, going back to the um, the financial paper, and um, just just from me, because we don't say this very often to finance. We normally beat them up for not giving us any money. Um, but just considering the last few months in terms of the different changes and the turnarounds around funding um, and protecting funding and end of year, etc. Um, it has, from my point of view, from finance, just worked seamlessly in terms of keeping on top of that. I'm sure Michelle sat there now thinking, oh my God, the things that we just got got in under the wire, etc., because that's the nature of the beast. But it, it hasn't, finance certainly hasn't been a block to anything going forward, and it's always been there when we've needed it. And um, if anything, um, we've, we've struggled sometimes to align the right money to right things from our end rather than the finance end. So um, just say thank you to the finance team. Yeah. So he's just been very positive because he wants it to continue. <laughs> if I want any money next time, I'll just remember this quote, okay. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Get, get your confidence in early, absolutely. Sam. No, thank you for that, Simon. Uh, it has been very difficult for the finance team to make sure that we keep the show on the road and, as you say, make sure that, you know, we get the relevant allocations in that we're entitled to uh, and, indeed, make sure that we have the appropriate expenditure uh, linked to that as well. So, Jackie, you did ask some other specifics around underperformance. If you look at the forecast outturn column rather than the year-to-date column, I, I think you will find that um, we're expecting quite a lot of expenditure during month 12. Um, in particular, you asked about maternity, etc. So, you know, that's a, an ongoing conversation that we have with the practices to make sure that we're anticipating the right level of expenditure uh, because there are certain elements that practices can claim for um, and they have a period of time in order to make those claims as well um, so we you know we obviously try and ensure that we um, uh, show all the expenditure that's appropriate in, in, in the in the right year so um, hopefully that answers your question in a sort of a general update term yeah. that's okay yeah, genuine, uh, very, yeah. very helpful and, and as you've heard and um, 
the team worked really closely with um, primary care team to ensure that you know we've interpreted their conversations correctly and make sure that we are uh, putting in the appropriate um, sums of money because some of these things do come with a bit of a time lag um, and you need to make sure that we keep on top of it. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other comments, questions? Um, we're asked to note this report and obviously we're, we've um, given a well done to the team for, for their, their efforts over the, this year to keep on top of all this. Thank you. Okay. Can we move then to primary care commissioning, oh sorry, sorry, to the locally commissioned services paper. Simon? Uh, thanks Margaret, I think that's for me, for Stephen. Sorry. Yeah. Right. And I sorry. just hope my connection's a bit better now, but shout at me if I break up. Okay. Okay, yes, yeah. so this paper um, proposes some new and uh, in some cases amended locally commissioned services, the LCSs, using the additional PMS reinvestment monies that we've got available to us. Um, so the intention is that we recommission our existing LCSs with no real major changes, um, using some of the PMS money for some of those schemes that we have done previously. Um, and I'll come back to the next committee meeting with a full breakdown of how we're actually using all of our PMS monies once we've agreed in principle, uh, hopefully today. Um, I have used the LMC costings tool to cost out all of the services um, and I'll work with them after this meeting as well to finalise those. Um, it's a shame they can't actually make this meeting today, but they have um, said to me they're happy to say that they are supportive of the proposals in this paper. Um, they're very happy for, to actually say that today. Um, so I will come back at the next committee also to finalise the, the actual details of the costs and come back to the specifications for sign off. So the aim today really is just to seek that broad agreement in principle to the outline schemes really and how we use the 228,000 PMS money that we've got available to us. And from my point of view, I don't think it's a major issue if not all of these schemes start on the 1st of April, because obviously we're not far away now. Um, it's quite possible that we'll still be income protecting practices in quarter one, that's subject to agreements over the next few days. Um, so it would seem at odds with that if we suddenly started new services and then had to income protect almost immediately. So if there's an urgent need for, some, for one of them, we can probably get it started in April and others may follow a bit later. Okay. So I'll go through each of the schemes very briefly and then perhaps pause for comments and queries. Um, so starting with the service for unaccompanied minors seeking asylum, um, looking for around £14,000 to cover this. Um, certainly um, there's a lot of challenges in managing the pathway for this cohort of patients, as you can imagine. Uh, lots of issues around delays in trying to get registered with GPs, trying to secure an NHS number, um, <clears throat> lots of issues with people changing their name and dates of birth and going through the system really. Uh, and, a, and a perceived lack of trust um, from these people with, uh, with the system generally in healthcare. Um, there's a number of young people that don't really engage with the hospital at all when it comes to having their bloods done, etc. Um, and a view that the hospital is probably not the best place for, for these young people to go to. Um, so our intention is to have two practices in the city that will register these vulnerable patients to help um, speed up the process of registration, make sure they get their initial assessment completed thoroughly and adequately uh, and get their trust really um, and, and at the same time reduce some of the demand on secondary care as well. So the practices involved would take, uh, undertake an initial health check in line with the guidance, take their blood samples, do some TB and other screening and then kind of initiate the appropriate vaccination plan. Um, we'd be looking for them to take as much of a holistic and proactive approach as possible and we'll be you know, able to give some training in that regard as well. Uh, so the LCS itself really is to recognise that commitment to look after this group of patients um, and secure outcomes for, for this cohort. Um, this has really been worked up mainly by the head of Integrated Children's Commissioning Team. Um, um, they've been instrumental in working up the draft spec. Dr Elizabeth Fellows has also had some input and been supportive in this. So I think it's uh, a really good use of the, of the PMS funding. 
In terms of the criteria for using PMS funds, I would say it fits in with uh, securing outcomes that go beyond uh, what's expected generally of general practice, certainly would go towards reducing inequalities and support uh, delivery of a new model of care in practice across a specific locality. Um, so we haven't got the two practices firmed up yet, but I've certainly gone out for interest and uh, the two practices that are closest to where these patients would be have kind of said they will give that some consideration and hopefully would possibly sign up to this scheme. So I'll stop there on this one and just see if there's any questions or comments I can take away. Nick, do you have a question on this one? Yeah, you've answered my first two points already, so that's fine. Uh, you haven't obviously identified the practices yet. My, my question was about, about um, uh, obviously at the moment, Portsmouth has now um, sort of reached agreement with other local authorities to not be receiving as many of these children or not be um, looking after them. They're going to be sort of dis um, dispersed into other local authorities that haven't, because historically we've had over the what's been safe to sort of look after. So is that is this a sort of item of service in a capitation-based uh, thing or is it just a sort of block of money to do it um, or based on however many that you happen to end up with? Yeah, so this is based on the expected numbers, Nick. So it will be activity based. Um, and yeah, the local authority have worked that through. Given what you've said, they've kind of um, reduced the numbers a bit to what we're used to in the past, but come up with a, a number that they, they would anticipate. And then we've, um, yeah, we're based payments on largely on activity, but with a small retainer as well to add into that. And we're confident we're going to identify practices that are interested in this with the conversations you've had so far. Yeah, I would be hopeful, Nick. We certainly, um, you know, if one or both of the practices that we would like to do this uh, are unable to for some reason, obviously we would go out to other practices that are also not too far away from where these patients are. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Michelle? I was... I was just wondering, given that we've got quite a long agenda, Margaret, whether we may change the focus slightly. I'm just suggesting that maybe we have a conversation about are we are we content with the 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 things being on the list, and then maybe some of the technicalities of how it might work um, is something that we could take offline and bring back if it becomes a problem. But just just wondering if that would help. Uh, it, it will certainly speed it up. Are people wanting to comment though on other aspects of, of the five proposals that are here in, in the basket of proposals? Nick, if you I've got a couple of other quick questions, so I can sh I can raise them now, and then you can address them as you go along if you wanted, Steve. Then if it helps it helps um, do things as you're going, would that be helpful? If you're sure. just quickly running through the rest. The question I have is one. One was on the safeguarding. Is is, is this previously been an, an NHS thing, or is it was previously a local authority? And then the, the one for the dermatology. You're talking about 12k into the basket of services for that. Um, you've mentioned about purchasing some equipment for dermatoscopes. Um, I'm presuming that this isn't just for that. It's also for the activity with using advice and guidance and sending photographs. Is that is that correct? If you can get, you can as a now as you go along if you wanted to. Yeah, so the um, the payment for that, Nick, is, is purely down to the extra work involved. Um, the kit is something completely separate and um, other colleagues are dealing with that side of it. So I think that kit will be supplied to practices under a separate stream. OK, thank you. Um, OK, Jackie, you have any questions? It's a comment, really. It might apply to all, but it certainly does to the deprivation and inequalities one. And I just wondered if it would be helpful to also make mention of maybe the voluntary service thing or organisations such as Positive Minds or social prescribing or carer support that is available with, within the city for children and for um, adults. Just make sure they're captured somewhere as a, as a help and support. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can do that, Jackie. Obviously, the, the practices involved are, uh, are aware to signpost to those services as necessary as part of their process when they do the health checks. But yeah, we can reflect that somewhere in the, in the specification. Well, if it's already there, fine. It was just, yeah, making sure that it was and that practices knew there's quite a bit of voluntary support out there as well and community support, hopefully, anyway. Um, can, I just add, can I just add to that, Jackie? I don't think some 
you won't be achieving, the practices won't achieve all the outcomes they're looking for in terms of a couple of those proposals, unless there is a good connection with the vol local voluntary community groups that are there already doing some of this work. And linking up with them is going to be quite important, I think. So, Steve, if you can make that more explicit, that would be helpful. Yeah, we can certainly add that. Obviously, the practices are uh, using their social prescribers for, for much of this, so they're obviously fully on board with, with that aspect. We can just reflect that in the specification. Yeah, and I think this, the social prescribers will help, but there are a range of, there, there will be a range of uh, groups that are outside of the social prescribers networks as well, I think, um, who, are who are involved in this sort of work. It's just worth making it explicit. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other comments or quest uh, questions on the five proposals? Clearly the money is that is against it is it looks reasonable, um, but we'll get more detail and a more detailed breakdown at the next meeting. Is that is that what you're saying, Steve? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I just wanted to get broad agreement in principle really to these these schemes and the use of the funding and we'll come back with a lot more detail next time. Okay. Are people happy to in principle agree with this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so in that case, we can move uh, to the next item, which is um, the update from Simon on uh, COVID and, and flu vaccines. Thank you. Um, at some point, I'm hoping to be able to give you a paper, but given the the nature of the changing beast it is, um, it, this normally gets um, pulled together the night before because um, we are seeing, still seeing things changing on a daily basis. Um, so I will update you as best I can on where we are. Um, briefly around flu, um, we, I think as we've noted previously, have had a, a really good uptake with the vaccination program, which has been excellent. Um, and that linked to um, all of the COVID measures around social distancing, hand washing, etc., cetera, um, has obviously had an impact of flu and we've not been made aware through the winter of any significant level of flu circulating within the community. So from that point of view, flu has been a, a complete success. COVID. Um, I wish I could say the same about COVID in terms of no significant levels, but obviously that's, that's not the case across the whole of the, of the planet. Um, so to update you in terms of COVID, as I think you're probably aware, we have five PCNs undertaking vaccination uh, services, two community pharmacies within the city, and we have the vaccination centre at St James's. Um, we have all five PCNs reporting having contacted or offered, sorry, contacted and offered all cohorts one to nine, which is the initial enhanced service to go from cohorts one to nine. They have all been contacted multiple times and we have given out 100% of the vaccines that, that come to us. Um, we have supported each other and wide across Hampton and Isle of Wight in terms of mutual aid with vaccines where we've needed to um, move some vaccines around to get the vaccines and the patients in the same place. And we've got um, a supportive network across the whole of Hampton Isle of Wight, including Solent with the vaccination centres, the PCNs and the hospital hubs, etc. So um, there is a, a, a well-trodden oiled path, well-trodden oiled pathway, I don't know, there's too many metaphors in there. Um, it sounds like we're going to slip up. Um, there's a, a well-trodden path that allows us to move the vaccines and the patients into the right place so we can um, try and get this to, to work as best as we can. Um, we are seeing some uh, non-attendance of booked vaccines, both in um, the PCN sites and in the national booking system, and via the national booking system in the vaccination centres. Um, what we are seeing through is that patients are um, booking in both sites, but not cancelling one of the, the allocations. So that slot then becomes empty. Um, vaccine isn't wasted. The vaccine will then be used in a, a, a subsequent clinic the following day. Um, but it does have an impact in resource in terms of a clinician 
um, and the lad had been staffed off and sat there um, with nothing to do, assuming there was somebody coming to be vaccinated. So um, that is that is um, we're seeing that as a slight increase in problem. Whether that needs more education, but we are in touch with comms around how we get best benefit from these things, etc. So we are doing our best to reduce that um, and maintain it. Um, we are working with the local resilience forum to access uh, a short call list in terms of any um, vaccines that are potentially left over where we don't have um, patients coming in and booking directly so we are accessing them and fire and police etc are being um, part of that short call and uh, we have a clinic tomorrow undertaking some of those so we, we are fulfilling currently all of our slots um, the next cohorts which is cohort 10 to 12 which wasn't part of the initial enhanced service um, has now been agreed with all of our five PCNs so all five PCNs will be going forward to vaccinate cohort 10 to 12 and we are now seeing the um, the national patient group directions have now been updated last night um, or the night before it was um, so we are now um, just about in the case of finishing off cohorts one to nine of those patients who are coming forward um, and we are just about ready to go for cohorts 10 to 12 as and when we get the national directive to go on to cohorts 10 to 12. So that's where we are currently. It's probably going to be a different picture tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but as we stand, that is pretty much where we are. Any questions whilst I take a breath? Sorry, are there any questions or comments on this? No? Okay. Simon, it's like you're off the hook. <laughs> are there can we then move to the next item on the agenda, which is Justina, and in terms of reference for the Primary Care Commission Committee. Thank you, Chair. So first, can I offer my apologies because the cover sheet is actually inaccurate. Um, these terms of reference have been bought here uh, because the Primary Care Commissioning Committee haven't seen them for a little while. Um, what I'm intending to do is, as many of the members are aware, we've got a revised operating model that's coming into existence. Um, so I'm intending to update these along with all of the other terms of reference for the CCG's committee, which will be brought back to the next meeting. Okay. So can I just chat? So nothing has changed because that was going to be a question. Yeah. So uh, actually, Nick, no, nothing has changed. One of the things we just need to double check is some of the delegation from NHSE. Um, so these, uh, the current terms of reference, are based on the national model from when we first took over and had the delegation agreement. There has been uh, a little bit of change in that in, in the last uh, year or so, but I don't, I don't know whether that has an impact on these terms of reference. So we will need to check. Okay, are there any other comments at this stage? Because it's coming back to the next committee? Yeah. Okay, Jackie. Um. It's a very quick one, Justina. And just a general one is that I noticed that it said um, the terms of reference will be reviewed from time to time. And I just wonder if actually it would be better just to give a time, no matter what tours it is, a, you know, annually every whatever it is absolutely thank you jackie like i say these were based on a national model but actually that particular sentence has been picked up by our internal auditors as well um because actually uh, as they've suggested uh, uh, like you that um it would be much more beneficial for the committee to see these reasonably regularly so we will put we will put a specific time frame in there thank you okay can we sign up yeah, I was just going to say, but when we put a time frame in, is it worth also adding that then rather than having, and I don't think this will be the case, having set times to update them, that we can actually revisit them in between times as and when needed? I'm sure you will, Justina. Yeah, thank you, Simon. There is, in, in, the, in our other terms of reference within the CCG committees, we actually do put that statement in there uh, based on any changes that happen. So we can revisit these as often as we need to based on those changes. Okay. People content with this, and we know we next. We'll deal with it next time. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we move then to the Guildhall Walk Healthcare Centre update, please? I think that one's mine. 
Yes, son. So this is to um, update the committee on the decision that was made to um, not to re-procure the APMS contract for Guildhall Walk Healthcare Centre. Um, so this is this is the current situation where we're in in terms of some of the the background in terms of it is a uh, a relatively small practice where the APMS contract was due to come to an end in September and at the um, almost same time um, we will be um, unable to use the premises um, because we've been given a section 25 notice from the landlord um, so we've been uh, led down a route that um, the committee decided that it was actually more beneficial and gave patients more um, choice in terms of not re-procuring than potentially moving the practice around to once or even a, a second move um, where we may or may not be able to actually come up with a suitable premises. Linked in also to the fact that we have new premises coming into the centre of the, the city towards the end of the year that are currently being worked on. So we have a, a project plan and we are working very closely with PHL around the elements within there, so communication, contracting, financial support, etc. Um, communication to patients has already started and patients have been sent their first letter um, and patients do have um, access directly through a, um, an email box to raise their concerns with the CCG as well as through the normal routes of telephone etc so they have uh, we are communicating with the patients and keeping close eye on and any concerns being raised there um, we are as i said having regular meetings with phl around how we work that and other stakeholders in terms of the the csu who are supporting elements of the plan um, we're working closely as I said previously with finance etc um, and all of the other elements within there without wanting to go into too much detail for each one in terms of IT, medicines management support, etc. Um, and any of the other services that are currently commissioned out of that site through PHL. Um, so in a very brief scan through the paper, that's where we are. Um, we're also linking in, uh, perhaps as you said earlier, with uh, practices um, and have had communications with the practices who are closest to the site um, and um, we will continue to keep those communication chains open as we work our way through the, the project plan. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions on this one. <laughs> yeah, thank you Simon. I think um, before we get into questions I think we just need to make the committee aware of the um, conversation that we had at HOSP um, and that we last week and we have been asked to go back to HOSP and to work um, with the patient participation group and others including the Health and Wellbeing Board however we we have through our conversations with PHL realised that they don't have an active patient participation group which has been a um, an area of concern previously and I think the practice um, did do some work with us pre-COVID to re-establish that um, but I think with COVID it, it it sort of you know perhaps fell at the first hurdle so there isn't an active participation group that we can liaise with however having said that I think it's still important that we are mindful of um, the HOSP's uh, decision and what they've asked us to do which is to um, in the event that the decision is confirmed to close the Guildhall Walk Centre as we did express that this is about not re-procuring the, the contract which will lead to closure. The panel have asked the CCG to work with said the patient participation groups and others to secure alternative provision as soon as possible as to the current surgery and to bring a report back to the hospital prior to September 2021. So I think that is what this paper does. Um, and certainly the project plan that sits in part of it is about how we will work with others to secure alternative provision for those patients as close to where they were currently receiving that primary medical care for. But just wanted to flag that, um, that that's what we've been asked to do um, before we get into questions, really. Yeah, and just the hospital in the health of the institution committee. Which is it a, is, sorry, it's apologies. Just, it's, Council Committee, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, Nick? 
Yeah, so I understand obviously patients have been informed and uh, obviously there'll be a period of sort of migration of patients um, of their own volition. Some may obviously be university students because it's a city centre practice, but obviously there may be a point of allocation. So when will we have a, some sort of um, feeling as to what that might require in terms of allocations of blocks of patients to practices? I know that they are relatively spread around, although predominantly in the south of the city, because obviously that could be something that might be potentially destabilising and obviously feed into the risk stuff that we were talking about earlier with practices um, potentially struggling with, with significant influxes of, of, of patients from Guild or Walk. So the, the, the process is, Nick, that um, patients will be given notification of which practices are they are within catchment of, and then they will be asked to make a choice of their their the first choice practice. At that point, we'll be able to see um, where we have any potential mismatch. Um, in terms of, of your comment about the students, yeah, you can see from the paper that the largest cohort, single cohort within there is the, the student population. Um, and we would expect a large number of those to remain close. And as the university practices moving into a city centre position, we would expect most of those students to go into into that city centre practice. Um, to give you some reassurance, the the whilst there might be some unknowns as we go through this, we'll obviously keep an, an eye on that and we'll work closely with the practices. But the the four practices who we have worked with. Um, in terms of the closest to that city centre site, have described an excess of capacity to take on the, that 8,400 and some patients. Um, so we are reassured there is capacity within the city. Um, and we also need to be mindful that um, although we can look at that map across the whole of the city and see that the patients are spread across the city, for whatever reason, those patients have chosen to have a city centre practice. Um, so it might be reasonable to consider that um, they would potentially still want to stay in a city centre practice for whatever, whatever reason that is. Um, so we can, until we get those numbers coming in, we can't make a, a, a decision that doesn't say practice X will, will have a, a huge influx. But uh, the situation we're in currently is that we are confident that we have capacity and that we've got a system that will identify it as soon as possible, should that be the case. I mean, I guess some registered historically when it was Guildhall Walk with the walk-in centre and the, the extended opening hours that it offered, which I guess may or may not be relevant now, depending on, on what it is that they offer. But I guess as long as we've got a dialogue, I just want to make sure that the committee was, was content that we've got a process in place that, we, that we're supporting this and, it, and it's not going to lead to some, you know, tidal wave that could be unmanageable. So thanks for that. Claire, I've got it. Claire, Curry, I've got your hand up. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so thank you, really useful paper. Um, and just a couple of points, if I may. So I've, I've, coming back to our previous discussions as committed to, and obviously as alluded to in the paper around um, the other services um, being reprovided. So, you know, clearly you've noted in there that, um, you know, mitigation actions and uh, reproviding of those services in a timely manner is being considered and actively worked on. Just really want to encourage um, further clarity, I suppose, around that. And I know there is a, you know, another six months before this, these changes come into effect, but would um, really welcome uh, further clarity on that to perhaps come to this committee and also to have further discussions on those. There are obviously some services which, you know, are currently provided from Guildhall Walk, but also I think relating to the wider context of the city, uh, particularly in relation to homelessness services, clearly Guildhall Walk previously had a role in delivering some fantastic services for the city. There is obviously a homeless healthcare team which provides, again, it's a really fantastic service at the moment, but I suppose just looking to the future, the, the kind of security around the continued provision of those things does become important as the picture of, of, the, of the primary care um, provision is changing um, and, and that does relate to guilt or walk. So I suppose what I'm asking for is one, um, that the further plans around the continued service provision for some of those things are perhaps brought back to this committee at some point with a bit more detail um, around those things. And secondly, just to, um, as you are doing and as has been noted again in this paper around the engagement of stakeholders, um, 
you know, and, and coming back to the point about the patient participation group, um, you know, really welcome further discussions either, you know, health and wellbeing board and also um, local elected members clearly having really good links and as a key conduit to local residents might well help um, some of those discussions too. So uh, just a couple of points and, and certainly welcome um, understanding a bit more about the mitigating actions for the, for the service provision. Okay, you happy with that, Sam? Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Jackie? Jackie, you have your hand up? Oh, sorry, yeah, I did, and probably very similar to Claire, but, um, is a, but specifically around the special allocation scheme. Now, I know we've got plans to re-procure that, and I just wondered how that was going or how much closer we were to getting that service reprovisioned. Steve, are you okay to comment on that one? Yes. Steve, yeah, on the special allocation scheme, Jackie, um, we are liaising with the other local CCGs that also use PHL for that service. Um, we've got a meeting next week again on this one to try and agree um, a plan forward. But essentially, we've got the service through to the end of August. We will offer out to local practices and our GP Alliance to see if there is any interest locally. Assuming there's not, because it hasn't been in the past, then we will link up again with the other CTGs who probably will find the same in their areas with a view to having a, hopefully a scheme that covers a wide geographical patch. Um, and PHO have actually indicated they would be interested in providing that for us in the future across a, a wide footprint. But obviously, we've got a bit of work to do to scope that out with the other CTGs as well. Yeah. That's, that's very, very helpful. Um, and I realise August might seem quite a way away, but to me that's like tomorrow. So I'm guessing some of these discussions kind of need to be happening. Thank you ever so much, Steve. That's really yeah. helpful. Just to reassure you on that point, Jackie, um, I, I think we all think that um, August is, is tomorrow. Um, and there is a, a very detailed uh, project plan that is discussed um, frequently to make sure we are keeping these things on track. I don't think it. Uh, um, I don't think the issue is the ability to undertake these things. It's the um, making sure that we keep the timelines to make sure it's a, an efficient process and as slick as best we can. And I know you work very hard, and do appreciate it. I mean it across your team. Thank you. I've, I'm, I'm half, yeah, on behalf of the team, who are very good, to be fair, um, I'll say thank you. Not from me, though. Okay. Can I? Ask if there are any other questions or comments on the Girls Hall Walk thing. Senator? Is there anything from Health Watch, Roger? Um, we, yeah, I am sorry, I was just struggling with my mute button. Okay. Um, yes, we did submit um, some questions to Joe and the team um, uh, about the transition arrangements and communication. Oh, Joe? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we've answered them fully, Roger. I don't think we had that at the time. I, I was just thinking one of the things as we've been talking about is the the way the project plan sits and, and the the work streams are, are really helpful for us, making sure we're doing everything together. But I think what we might benefit from is putting that pro that transfer, the end to end transfer process together in a in a very simple one page summary that says this is when the patients will get the first letter, this is what it will tell them, this is when they will get the second letter, this is what they will do, because all of this is about enabling patient choice and supporting patient choice. But as, as Simon says, we, we the CSU have a very sophisticated tool which looks at your individual address and plots the practices, around, the five practices around your boundary, so you have a choice of that. Um, again, until we've gone through that process, we may see that actually that that hasn't worked for patients because lots of these patients sit out of a city centre boundary, but have um, have chosen a city centre location. I think that's unlikely that we would see a huge disconnect because I, I think the boundaries of most of our city practices do go do go across. So we're very. I think we're, you know, reasonably assured and confident that we will be able to match the choice where we've got the capacity, but we need to look at that and make sure that there isn't a disconnect and how we manage that and how we support 
um, those more vulnerable patients with making that choice and ensure, as Claire said, the homeless uh, homeless patients are directed and supported into those new homeless services that we have so they don't get lost. So I think we perhaps need to just think with our comms team how we put that on a single side of A4 that is really clear and sets out the very clear timeline. So and I think that would answer your questions, Roger is what we've attempted to do in this paper, but probably still doesn't give that that end-to-end -end bit really clearly, um, if that's helpful. Thanks, Jo. Can I... Is that Simon with your hand up? Or? I'd like to put a hand up for a, a, an agenda item that I'm supposed to be leaving on. Um, just, just a comment on that um, when Jo and I were presenting at HOSP, um, it was commented on that we had the support of Health Watch running through. So thank you for Roger in terms of the support to the committee on what can be difficult decisions. We're all thanking each other today. So thank you, Simon, and your team as well. <laughs> hey, uh, in the midst of all those thanks, I think we, we agree, we're noting the update from Gainesville Walk, and we've also agreed, I think, that we should have a report back um, at the next meeting in a bit more detail about the services that that will need to continue and how those services will be continued um, once the Israel War has closed. Okay, thank you. Um, can we then move to the Colcom Collins um, locally? And uh, I think that's Robert. I, yeah, I'm just going to introduce this and Robert's here to, to support in terms of uh, any questions. So uh, we had hoped to bring a re-specified um, Leisure Commission services for, for the Community Pharmacy Service to the group um, in light of our understanding and changes of the um, demand for this service. Um, we have been working closely with Soland and the Community Pharmacy teams um, over the, the previous year or so, but obviously with the, the demands on on the both the pharmacy service and the Solent teams in terms of COVID, it's been impossible to properly review the service um, and to then prompt any discussions with the clinical advisory group around changes. Um, so it's to, to notify the committee to, uh, in order to give us six months breathing space to really look at the data set and to make sure that we get best efficient use of this resource um, that we're our intention to roll over for a few further six months um, just to reassure the group this is a a highly um, probably not unfair say treasured service that the um, GPs use and our um, our concerns with it is the the capacity for it to fit in with all the demands of it so um, I'm confident that rolling the service over for six months will be met with a, a positive uh, response from practices um, and that um, it should give us the time to give a, a proper um, considered review of the service so it's really there for noting um, that that's going to be our way forward currently okay. Do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, it's um, going to give us the breathing space, like Simon said. Um, we do intend to take it back to a clinical advisory group to get some advice and maybe a bit of a steer, because I've got a few questions about um, how best we might might develop it. Um, so the yeah, added time is going to help us get it right. Okay. Um, any questions or comments? Are people happy to agree the extension of six months for the NCS scheme? Yep. Yeah. Any dissent? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, then sure. we can move to the next item, which is the sequin. That is uh, the Commissioning for Quality and Innovation Scheme, um, which Chris is going to um, introduce. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Margaret. It's fast time, didn't we? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So I brought this to the January meeting. So it was a draft version um, of the scheme, obviously very sort of uh, draft version. It was just more, more headlines. Um, this is the actual final version of the scheme. Um, it comprises both the commissioning and the prescribing elements. Um, we've had to there's been an issue obviously due to the timing of the meetings. Unfortunately, I haven't actually been able to 
um, to bring this to you and get final sign off as part of this meeting. It's actually out with practices now uh, for sign up because it starts on the 1st of April. So the timings haven't worked out that well. Um, I have, I did share this with committee members electronically. Um, so I had some, you know, a, a bit of feedback on that and I have responded, responded to that. And um, so it was really just to bring this, the final version of the scheme to you today and just to find out if you have got any questions or if you need any clarification around some of these areas of work. Um, I will say it looks very similar to previous year's scheme. So we've just built on, you know, what we've had previously, what's worked really, really well um, within that scheme as well. And this is very much a framework of activity as well. So you'll see it's not, you know, we haven't gone down to the minute detail. That comes when we actually ask for the activity to be undertaken throughout the year. So I try and spread it across the year as much as possible. And that's when we start to look at the, an actual proper breakdown of what it is we're asking practices to do. So this is still very much a framework. And if there is any sort of adjustments or anything that needs making, we can do that, you know. So, you know, I'd welcome your views on the scheme and if you do have any questions at all. Okay, Dave? Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christine. Um, I've, I've got a comment, and then I've got a question. If, if yeah. I may. And, and my comment is, um, you remember at the last meeting, um, I didn't make a comment about the IT and the amount of different types of apps and, and schemes that that we were sort of introducing and, and yeah. putting out there. I, I, I just say I'm, I'm reassured, having seen the final version, that that I think the balance is 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 about right, which is which is good. But my my question is around the e-consult. I think um, those of us who are involved in at practice level will 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 agree that the, the amount of e-consult usage and demand has has grown exponentially through, yes. throughout the COVID crisis, and that's very understandable. Um, and practices are, are doing quite a bit of work to to try and manage those e-consults in the best yeah. the best possible way. I do recognise that it's up for retender, um, mm -hmm. but I, but I know of one practice in the city, one PCN in the city, that's had some meetings with e-consult on on how best to manage it and they've identified training packages yeah. um, to, to support practices um, in how they manage the, the, the number of e-consults coming in and I just wonder whether there's any flexibility in the scheme for the, you know, the CCG to fund that training at citywide level um, yeah. for, for PCNs because undoubtedly going forward over the next year or so e-consults the demand is going to be there whether it's provided by eConsult or it's provided by another provider mm -hmm. so I, I think that training would be really useful and um, uh, and, and and you know welcomed uh, amongst practices yeah okay thank you Dave um, yes yeah, so I've actually gone back to eConsult this morning to find out about that training um, we and we are trying to be as flexible as possible, obviously, with the sequence scheme, I think, as well, just from learnings from this past year. Um, we have also set aside some funding, so it hasn't been um, assigned to maybe all of the activity. So we can, we can actually, you know, be responsive to, to needs such as this. Um, so, yeah, so I see because online consultation sits within the sequin, hopefully we will be able to fund the, fund the training as well through that scheme. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Christine. Simon? Yeah, just, just to add on, on what Dave mm -hmm. said. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd already asked the question for you via a couple of emails last night, Dave, to, to see if we could identify funding for that. So... Um, Great minds is that the correct place? Um, but I think what this is a this is this demonstrates is that um, using the, the the new IT as it comes in line and we can use it in healthcare, we need to be mindful that we have to evolve the practices to use that. Um, and I'm I I think what my perception is with e-consult because um, Dave's right, there have been some practices who have been struggling to to cope with the the open demand that e-consults can provide is that um, we can make a, a, a huge shift in, in using IT and giving access to patients, um, but we need to allow the practices to evolve to cope with that as well. Um, and that 
isn't always in our gift. Sometimes it's down to we can we can show a direction. But uh, obviously, if if we don't have I don't know the correct skill mix or the correct timers, etc., that that we can um, support that. But anything that we can do to support that and get a, a more efficient use of of um, primary care for those patients that can use it, that then releases a resource for those patients that can't use it. We end up with getting that balance right, but we need to allow the practices time to evolve and to support that. And if we can, we can fund any training to to support that evolution. And I think that just came seen as a positive. Nick, yeah, just as a comment, really, I think I think one of the things that came out of discussions we had with with this PCN that's been doing done, done this work is that actually a much higher proportion of these can be dealt with without a, a direct phone call back to the patient. I think what you, what a lot of people are using these for is e-consult comes in and patient gets phoned for a huge proportion apart from the very simple administrative uh, type of task and I think they've realized there's a lot of different ways that you can use it and use it in a much more sophisticated way um, but I think we it's a bit of technology that we're using probably but we're using it in an old-fashioned way and I think um, you know one of the one of the GPs that we spoke to yesterday was very much actually for, for me as a health professional I would be very happy to to contact and I do use it for my own practice to to send in things and, and things and we can we can communicate remotely without ever having um, to actually talk to someone now that may be appropriate in some cases it may not be appropriate but I think is there's there's a lot of power in this to show actually it can be used a bit a little bit more smartly to try and work but I think if we can share that knowledge then I think that would be really helpful in, in making sure that it's a, it's a robust service because I know that certainly the volume of it is something that, that is being hard to manage so that's welcomed. Yeah okay thanks Nick. Roger? Um, <clears throat> I was just going to uh, feedback uh, about e-consult. Um, I sit on two PPGs because I'm mm -hmm. part of the treatment centre PPG and my own surgery PPG and I think patients would like training on how to use e-consult at times because they find it quite repetitive and mm. ask and I, I kind of understand why but I think patients find it a bit of a struggle uh, I personally I absolutely love it and I use it all the time um, just looking at the technology section Chris I'm just mindful that uh, blended seems to be a term that I've heard used uh, yeah. a lot recently I don't know if that's a NHS reset term mm -hmm. um, but it is just being mindful that not everyone has access to technology yeah. I always use the example of my mum who's now 84 mm -hmm. and has a landline she yeah. doesn't have wi-fi she doesn't get a tablet she doesn't get an iphone so it's just being mindful that services are still offered to people and and on an equitable basis as well yeah, no, definitely. I think we've got, you know, we've still got a lot of work. We can't forget that as well around those patients. Just wanted to make so. the point and have it minuted. So thanks, okay. Chris. Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Could I just very quickly come back on what you mentioned there, Roger, in terms of patient experience, because I think that's really, really important. And whether whether within this, is there anything that we can look to, to help practice to put on their websites in terms of education how to videos is there any stuff out there or do we yeah. need to try and generate some stuff that actually we can signpost patients to say this is how to use it or in future use it like this so we can give people the some of the tools to use it in a smarter way i know sometimes people will go i've talked to patients and they'll sometimes have to play around with it in a certain way to get it to get it to do what they want i know that may be something that's out, out with the scale of it but if there's anything that we can do that can help patients use it in the, in the best way then we can try and share that and then practice can chuck it on their website as a link or whatever yeah Sounds brilliant yeah certainly i think there is quite a lot of sort of resources out there that you know we can share with the practices to share on their websites also it's about working with the ppgs and um, also our social prescribers um you know they'll be doing quite a lot of work around this as well so um so yeah thank you any other questions or comments? Can I ask a question just uh, yeah. in terms of the, se the sequence this year or similar to last year and yeah. the last year's with building the M4. Um, do we have progress measures? How, how do we measure progress uh, against what we're trying, the outcomes we're looking for through the sequence? Yeah, so all of the, all each part of the activity within the scheme that obviously comes with measures and I measure that on a quarterly basis so I have got data there and um, 
Also, I'm just waiting for the previous scheme to sort of finish because we've got to wait for data to become available. Um, so I will be looking at those measures, that data, um, and I do plan on putting together a report on the previous scheme so we, we can look at those measures, what's worked well, what hasn't worked so well. Once I've done that as well, I'm happy to bring that back to, to the, the committee um, to have a look at that, to share that with you. I think that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Any other questions or comments? We're happy to um, just ratify what, what uh, Chris has put together in terms of this year's scheme. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Can we then move to the next item, which is a, a application for practice name change? And Steve, I think your name stands for this one. Yes, yeah, so um, obviously everyone's aware of the university practice relocating to the city centre and as part of that move, the practice uh, have asked they would like to change the name of the practice to become the Uni City Medical Centre. Um, and the reason really for coming to the committee, I think, is because to do that, we would need to do a contract variation. So we need to sort of get agreements uh, before we can actually do that. But I would, I would probably suggest that unless people felt the name was inappropriate in some way then um, you know we'd have to have real good grounds for not agreeing to do this and do the variation but happy to listen to people's comments okay and it's not they're not asking for alternatives <laughs> this is <laughs> okay all right we're happy to agree and approve this name change any dissent okay thank you very much um, can we then move to the primary care contract review uh, terms of reference, Steve? Yeah, just really briefly, Margaret, we, we just amended our terms of reference for our contract review group, um, which is where we mainly discuss GP contractual issues, including any um, risks around the contracts and any potential breaches, decisions around that, etc. So we just added some notes around the membership of the group, tightening that up a bit, uh, the purpose of the group, and that we will report in future the minutes to this primary care commissioning committee as well. So you have sites of, of those minutes. Um, and we're just changing the, the scope of the meeting slightly to widen it out really. Um, so that it won't just be about contractual issues, but wider primary care matters, such as locally commissioned services, because um, we used to in the past discuss those in quite detail at the primary care operational groups, which used to run in the past, of course. Um, so I think we will just make use of the contract review group for some of those wider discussions. Um, and as I say, the minutes will be reflected um, at this committee. Okay. Are there any questions or comments on that? What's being proposed? No? Okay. Um, oh, Jackie. Sorry. Sorry, and it's a, it's um, oh, it's a silly one, really. Is there any reason why APMS contracts aren't included in this? Have I missed the point? I'm just, not that I really know what it is, but um, I'd have to have a look at that, Jackie. But um, after the closure of Guildhall Work Surgery, we won't actually have any APMS contracts left in Portsmouth as it happens, but um, we can certainly, for the time being, add in APMS if that's missing from there, Jackie. Thanks for that. Yep. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, just to say, in terms of the APMS, um, we just need to be mindful that although no GP practices will operate under an APMS contract in the city, we do have um, the Portsmouth Primary Care Alliance um, operating under an APMS and we have separate contract review mechanisms um, and really good kind of um, engagement mechanisms with the provider in terms of service developments etc already um, so we just need to be mindful that if we are including it to APMS we need to think through the, the implications and whether that's something we want to do or not but I'll pick that up with you offline Steve. Okay so with that action we will are you happy to agree the amendments that are proposed? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, and that brings us to the end of our meeting. Is there any other business? No. In which case, um, I'll close the meeting. We'll ask Jane to close the meeting. In terms I'll just of 
Thank you, Chair. I'll just turn off the live streaming. One moment, please.